done. Yeah. Yeah. So how is it, how's it looking from your, uh, your vantage point there? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Essentially like I'm like, it, it was an epiphany today when I was talking with this guy and he told me about this ants colony thing. And then I, I watched a YouTube video on it. Uh, and I was like, wow, like yeah. that's exactly what's happening. Like, and it's, it's natural. And like, the more I talk about the fact that it's natural, the more, you know, proofs I, I see it is. And yeah. this whole property of emergency and like something emerging from a bunch of, you know, things uh, rubbing together is, yeah. is exactly this. Yeah, no, it's, it's wild the way that, you know, our, especially the, the, the introductions or the different little pieces people throw into Slack, those are our little pheromone trails, which then the ants are able to kind of, you know, we each follow them and snuffle along to where we need to be. And it's just figuring out how do we, it's, it's those little tweaks to make it so that the whole system can be more effectively emergent. But yeah, it's, it's inspiring. It's pretty neat. It's nice. Yeah, like I was talking, I was talking about the flares, the sparks. And yeah. that, that's it, like it's chemicals, it's things that flow around, you leave them here and there, and then they grow into something. Yeah, and it's funny, because I mean, the different ways that our, our whole organization that works that way, and then, you know, the discussion on security, and really having that realization that what we need is to build, to build that kind of emergent security as well, where it's rather than us having some sort of a monolithic security structure, it's having the whole set of different practices and different ways of both, um, applying and observing what's happening so that we can have the more secure things go where they need to go. And yeah, I, I think it's going to be interesting watching the different ways that, that we evolve as an organization that way. Yeah, I'm also amazed at different, you know, ways that teams are tackling stuff. And exactly that, you know, like, it's crazy to me, like, obviously, I haven't had an intention or like I didn't know that like this prioritization of tasks at the very beginning will have such an impact and that it will be the key driver of this progress. But now I'm tracing it back and I'm realizing, wow, like yeah. if we wouldn't do that, if we would start with 10 tasks, nothing would be, you know, coming out of it. Just, mm -hmm. you know, nothing. Yeah. This balance between like focus and enough um, mental space and like dimension to bounce off this creativity and chaos is, is that formula. Yeah, yeah. I'm also, it was interesting seeing kind of on that macrocosm, microcosm part, you know, the, the thing that Andrew was drawing there, showing those four different silos and how we have the redundancies that are going on. <coughs> That's powerful moving forward. Uh, in talking with Maya this morning uh, and going through the, that assessment form with her, um, it was interesting with that as well, of realizing you know, they're really focusing on the heart risk factor. That's, that's where all of their focus is right now. And that one of the things that I'm curious about is how, how easily, I haven't dived into any of the code. Python isn't actually my, my specialty at all, but I need to figure out how flexible that is. So is it something that if we then say, okay, great, we know about, about um, heart risk, now we're looking at, at smoking or BMI. Is that something where we can now build a new set of keywords and plug it in and have things flow through in a similar way? Or how many places are there where we need to take a wrench to the pipeline and modify things in order to get meaningful results at the end? Because especially for the long-term piece, you know, that's, that's the real goal is seeing how can we have as few places as needed where it's then finely tuned information that we swap in that then allows us to take things in a totally different direction. Yeah, basically figuring out how to build reusable rockets. And yeah. that's essentially what it is. And I think your hypothesis, I had the same hypothesis today. And then I had the risk factors daily call. And I realized that like it's already emerging just through different ways. So yeah. I also talked uh, about this on the call with Andrew. So like not to repeat myself, I'm going to send that video. But basically what we're building is um, a mix of, you know, manual investigation that is happening right now and a mix of technology that will essentially at some point converge to a completely new way to have researchers produce relevant insights. And mm -hmm. that is mostly because the way how they uh, do this process right now, 
they uh, read between the lines. It's not about keywords. It's not about you know specific sentences or what regulates or upregulates what parameters. It's what they synthesize between the lines of all of these papers. And it's it's amazing that there is a gap in that that no one has done it before. But it also makes sense because it's such a complex topic. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm I'm really interested in looking at how do we. Really what we're trying to build is it's there's there's the artificial intelligence framework that's there, but then there's this piece that's around it. it's it's human in the loop augmented intelligence. It's about how do we make it as easy as possible for the actual expert to to iterate through the stuff in a way that that as quickly as possibly gets them gets the system refined to give them what they need. There's a couple of pieces, and this is this is sort of on the bigger the big picture side. Um, it's funny how much this project relates to an, an old project that I had to shelve, but I'm, I'm really interested in a couple people possibly add to the pipeline later on. Um, one of the things that seems like it's, it's missing right now, but that, that if we can bridge it, even if it's manually at first, will be powerful, is once we have the best articles coming out the end, to then be able to look at doing a little bit of ontological engineering and being able to actually pull things together and whether that's you know in owl format or whatever we do but having something so that we can build models that are relevant to whatever the domain is that it's then possible to ask questions around um, yeah. i'm curious about what can be done with that and then the ways that that could then be built into something that where the, the output might even be something like a simple a simple expert system on a mobile phone or something so that people can quickly drill into the information that's that's relevant to them from something that's a more complicated knowledge-based reasoning engine. So again, those aren't those aren't things for round one or round two of a Kaggle anything. But yeah. I think that if we can if we can get those pieces added on, the entire pipeline that we will have built um, could get repurposed to so many different domains in a in a powerful way. Yeah. And just like Imagining this idea that any organization, I'm not even talking about like hospital coming to us and saying, hey, we have so much data, like yeah. we have no clue what to do with this, but we would like to solve these problems and just like supplying them with this engine, with these engineers, with this fuel, all of these things to launch the idea and the team and basically utilize the data and the existing infrastructure. Yeah, that's definitely the the long-term, long-term vision. And so I think hinting at some of that or having a little bit of discussion about that as a long-term thing, when we have a conversation with the conversation with Agnes Stein, I think will be really interesting because again, with his connection into that smart city piece, that's a really interesting potential use case for a pipeline like this, where you may have a municipality that has all kinds of different data and the ones that are coordinating it most effectively might be able to do some really interesting things that have a pretty immediate impact. You know what's what's funny, like, and here comes the hashtag bullshit talk. But <laughs> I, from what we're seeing, it's really like there is a pattern of the of the process of unbundling governments into cities, because it's really like governments are just powerless. They they can't do anything, and it's it's completely like they're done. But at the same time you can see a lot of efforts being done on the on the city level and mm -hmm. a lot of uh individuals helping on that local level because it's much easier it's much more flexible and usually you know there there's less bureaucracy less regulation and all of these things to enable some forms of participation yeah yeah no and i think i think it's it seems like, I mean, so many of the things that were the, the best digital, I mean, I think that there's reasons for a larger scale um, organizational body to exist, but that so much of why it's structured the way that it is, is based off of stuff that made sense. It made complete sense two centuries ago, but that now we have such an easy way to decentralize. And there's, there's a lot of interesting conversations to have around that, around how, how do you ensure that you are not simply shuffling where the privilege lands, but are making sure that you actually make something that's equitable. Um, but, but yeah, I think I think there's all kinds of interesting ways that that this this plays into that overall shift and overall movement towards functional functional democracy that's around 
higher levels of civic engagement, where it isn't simply about somebody saying, you know, I'm going to vote for Pepsi, but is about somebody saying, um, here's my levels of expertise, here's, the, here's what I'm involved in on the ground, and here's how I can add that domain knowledge and my own ideas around where things should go functionally into an organic complex system uh, where, where good things can then trickle out of it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, I, I can see some emergent structure coming out of both, um, you know, disruptions of big corporations, which are definitely happening. And we can see it by, you know, interacting with Google and AWS by them not being able to be flexible enough. And like the last email that I wrote to AWS, I just asked them, please just tell me if this is not possible. So I, I'll stop bugging you. And that's it. And I didn't get a reply. Yeah. Well, and I think that's one of the other things that's interesting with this kind of an emergent anthill sort of an organization that this is, is that not just with, with you know, this COVID-19 situation or the next pandemic, but any sort of a major black swan event that's going to change how things happen, um, the ability for this kind of a system to pivot into, into a functional response to it um, is high as compared to any other structure that has the scale sufficient to have an impact. Because with that scale usually comes that momentum and that inability to turn quickly. Whereas it seems like what we're building is something that has that, um, I mean, it's, it's like, it's like it's it's equally big and dynamic with yeah. and, the magic. And, and, and so one of the things that I'm interested in seeing what can come out of that is, you know, even if this ends up being a not-for-profit organization, which I think is what it needs to be, um, the degrees to which I think it can be something that's all kinds of sustainable as an organization, it can bring in all kinds of, of, of resources. The trick is just that then those resources get tasked to making it even faster and able to respond to a wider range of, of, of areas. And, and also that it becomes replicable. We don't have to be the be all end all. We're pioneering something that's here, but by open sourcing the stuff that we're doing, then people who are working in a totally different domain can then replicate and tweak what we're doing to, to fit with whatever the domain is. Yeah, it all comes down to us creating that case study, that template that other companies can reuse. And yeah, like the more I think about this launch pad idea and being able to launch rockets into the space, the more it makes sense. And like, it's, it's just a question of showing people how, you know, how to build uh, a bike, how to build uh, a wheel. And then like, it just takes off. Yeah. And one of the other pieces that I'm really liking about it, and I think, I mean, this is, this is again, sort of from far out talk, but rather than, you know, a typical management structure tends to be, you know, here's what the hierarchy is. Here's the people we're going to plug into those roles. And then here's the ways that will ensure that everyone's conforming to that. And really to get as observational as possible so that it's possible to see, okay, here's somebody who's, who's going crazy with the data, they're doing all kinds of enrichment, they're making things work, they're good at communicating and getting other people on board. Um, so it doesn't matter what we call them, but to, to have sort of the data viz available so that we can see, okay, this is clearly a functional node. Um, so how do we as, as an organization quickly and effectively respond to that to make sure that that person is able to continue doing what they're doing and to scale it up as needed? Yeah, basically, creating a data-driven innovation process because, you know, a lot of companies are talking about data-driven innovation. Right. In reality, it's, it's not data-driven. You're just, you know, siloing data and building algorithms on top of it. The real innovation comes from the actual human beings cooperating and collaborating. And yeah, like even that discussion on Slack on, on the matter of active uh, members is very interesting because it actually lays out the foundation for like, what do we define as a, an active member? And like, how do we quantify that uh, activity and where that data point comes from? And, you know, the, the sooner we can figure that out, and I think there are some efforts to do that, you know, in between, you know, edges and, and teams, and we're all thinking about it, but we haven't yet, you know, defined it because all, all of these things are very complex. Like even, like, it's actually great that this happened now and not when, you know, people were communicating through email and right. like Jira or other 
systems that are increasingly complex and not as flexible as Slack. But even the fact that Slack has some form of analytics, even the fact that Slack is able to provide all kinds of uh, data, exports, and all of that stuff is amazing because we can basically at least get the data points from Slack, from Trello, from GitHub, and then create this ultimate, um, I don't know, like what, what to call it, but something that combines all of it yeah. and potentially spits out some insights. Totally. And, and something that ideally any of the individual pieces, so, you know, a Slack or a Trello, um, those can be deintegrated and replaced as new things come along. It's not that those are inherent, they just fulfill a given function. And, and, and so we can put those in. The other thing that comes to mind is figuring out how do we keep on approaching the challenges and the things that are confusing or unusual with a sense of curiosity rather than frustration. So as an example, all of the people who, uh, you know, when we go through the analytics and we say, okay, there's, you know, 400 people who aren't, who are on Slack but aren't actually posting, what that makes me think of is, is junk genes and that terminology and DNA where, you know, for the longest time, biologists were just like, oh yeah, it, th those are junk genes. We don't, they don't do anything um, because we didn't understand what their function was. And that it's a similar thing here where we have some particular cubby holes that, that we're used to using as an organization and how do we keep on reflecting back and saying, well, no, what is that? That's interesting that we have 800 people here. We have some assumptions around why and what those people are and what they're engaged with or not. Um, but how do we actually go into discerning what's that really about? Because I think that part of us building a complex organic structure that's new um, is that there's going to be all kinds of stuff that we don't understand and that we'll, we'll try to apply a given you know, paradigm too, and some of them will work better than others. But for us to keep humble about the fact that we actually don't have a clue what it is we're building, we have some ideas, we have some ideas of where we want it to go. Um, but keeping curious about like, what's the actual nature of what this thing is. Yeah. And yeah, again, it's, it's about being humble and understanding that we have no clue. That's it. Like, it's a big science experiment that we're running every single day. And every single day uh, right now in coronavirus uh, age is, is literally month of a typical corporation or organization, yeah. simply because, first of all, we're not relying on any specific individual in any of the efforts. And the amazing thing, and I talked about this with Andrew on the other call, we don't really care what people do in their lives as professionals. Like, I, yeah. I still have no clue what you're doing. Like, <laughs> right. no idea. Like, honestly, I checked out your LinkedIn. I saw something VR, something. That's it. But like the, I, at first I was saying, like, I don't have time to check that out. But in reality, like, I, it's not that I don't have time. It actually doesn't matter. Yeah. And like, I have no idea what most of the people do in their, uh, you know, professional life. And it's really about the things that you're doing here and how mm -hmm. you're helping this whole system. And yeah. it's, it's so like, again, similar to nature and the fact that there is no, like, you know, there is no university in nature that teaches you how to be very specific at being just accountant and that's it. Like, yeah. it's flat. Congratulations, you're now a B. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just people, things are what they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. No, well, thanks, this, I think it's good to, to have these periodic conversations that are looking at things on that on that larger level and will help us when we're actually nose to the grindstone in the trenches figuring out how do we go about things um, being able to occasionally pull back up into into this zone yeah for sure i think podcasts will be huge and I also agree. inviting external people to yeah. show them what is going on in here and i have a lot of people that i've observed through my life that you know, could be very beneficial to plug into this process just because again, like it doesn't matter what person does, it, it matters what kind of person they are and what kind of, you know, value they can bring into this. Even if it's just 30 minutes of them speaking on podcast and saying, you know, you know, this looks like a, like a ant colony, you know, this looks like that. 
And then me coming back and thinking, oh, wow, yeah, that's a powerful analogy. I'm going to go ahead and tell it to Tyler, to Daniel, to Frangis and other people. And then it propagates, it propagates, and something yeah. amazing may emerge in, in two, three days. Mm -hmm. No, I love that idea. And also having, inviting outsiders to come in to check it out. Um, and also having different people from some of those wide domains uh, come in and give little talks for the people who are interested. I mean, I think it'd be great to have an entomologist come in and say like, yeah, in terms of the functionality of how you're doing things, you know, you're, you're most like a termite colony or whatever, you know, whatever it is that they yeah. clean by looking. Whatever at. it <laughs> is, you know, and it's actually like, here's the thing. We have a unique power of this, you know, community that trumps any of our individual possible efforts. And yeah. what it is, like, if we do decide to, let's say, bring Ray Dalio from Bridgewater Associates on a podcast, like, individually, like, I can write hundreds of emails to him personally. He'll most probably ignore them because that's just some crazy person <laughs> that is writing to him, some stalker. But if we have 800 people sending yeah. an email, tweeting at him at the same time, mm -hmm. I bet he won't be able to ignore it. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, this Thanks. Is this is this is going to be a very interesting video to upload to YouTube and annotate. I'm also like I'm fascinated by like I knew that the videos would work, the time stamps would work, but I didn't realize it will be hundreds of hours. And right. That's amazing, and yeah. it's only going to grow. And the more we do these, the more power it will bring. For sure. Actually, I have a new tool, uh, I'll, uh, I'll tell you about it later, but another tool that may help with us tinkering around with how we have uh, structure emerge and information emerge. All right. Sounds Thanks. good, man. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.